Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When you meet uh, people in authority or the lay person and you ask them about the condition of the ummah and many of them share with you some very personal stories. Some of them share with you perhaps a frustration they might have had the place of work, others perhaps in the homes. But a recurring theme seems to be that we have not embraced excellence. Now, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came as a perfect example that today, and I'm not sure whether the, the panelists will agree with me, it's not about agreeing with me, but it seems that mediocrity is something that we celebrate. Uh, Ziyad, Jazakumullah for coming, right? Uh, my uh, question to you, when you think of excellence, what comes to your mind? Well, first, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thanks for having us here. The first important thing, or the most important thing about excellence, let me give you five mm. of the most important things for every believer. Excellence is, or ihsan in Arabic, you know, ihsan means beauty and excellence. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, الَّذِي أَحْسَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَ That Allah has created everything with ihsan, with beauty and excellence. Mm. So when we look at National Geographic, for example, you look at Discovery Channel, what you are recognizing is the excellence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infused into what he has created. Now, if we understand this concept, it's the vastest, most vast concept in Islam, and it basically impacts on every sphere of our religion. Mm. And first of all, it's the reason we were created, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That Allah created life and death in order to test the excellence in our actions. Yeah. He didn't say in our acts of worship. Mm. He said amalan. Mm. Amalan means in every mm. Uh, action of ours and then it's the secondly it's the reason he sent his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam because the prophet yeah. says to us in a hadith he says bu'ithtu li utammima husn al-akhlaq i have been sent to teach you only beauty in the way you behave mm -hmm. okay and then to confirm in a hadith there's a verse in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna allah ya'muru bil 'adl wal ihsan wa ita'i dhil qurba and ibn mas'ud radiyallahu anhu he says this is the most comprehensive verse in the Quran. And in a hadith, the Prophet says, Inna Allah katab al ihsana ala kulli shay. That Allah has commanded ihsan in every single thing we do. That means if you are a doctor, you have to be the best doctor you can be. If you are a teacher, the best teacher you can be. Whatever dimension or whatever profession you find yourself or whatever phase of your life you find yourself in, you have to function at that level. Because if you do that, it's something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Number four, it is the measure of faith and piety. Mm. Because the Prophet says in a hadith, he says, Akmalul mu'minina imanan, ahsanum khuluqan. That the most perfect of you in faith is the one who is most beautiful in his behavior. Wa khiyarukum khiyarukum li nisaim khuluqan. And the best of you are those who are best to their wives mm. in treating them. You know? Some wives and, are smiling. Yes, <laughs> and so <laughs> the Prophet says that albiru husnul khuluq, mm. that piety. Mm is beautiful character. Mm. You know, so we have this thing when a person uh, fits a certain profile from the outside, we mm. say, mashallah, this is a pious man. Yeah, correct. But what we're learning from the sunnah, mm. that the first thing to look at is the man's behavior. Mm. If he has the behavior and then he has a certain look, well, then he's the best of people. Yeah. But if he has the one and not the other, there's no good in him. Mm. And the fifth point I want to make is that this deen, this way of life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us is his ihsan upon us. Mm. Because when we behave beautifully, we're finding now with biopsychology that when a human being behaves well, it benefits his own body. Yeah. So, for example, when you carry out acts of goodness, yeah. your body releases oxytocin yeah. and dopamine yeah. and immunoglobin, yeah. all the serotonin and all the hormones that make you feel good. And when you behave negatively, your body releases adrenaline and epinephrine yeah. and cortisol, all the uh, hormones that are harmful for you. So literally, when you behave beautifully, when you behave with excellence, it's for your own benefit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms this in the Quran. He says, in ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. If you behave with excellence, you do it for your own benefit. Well, in asa'tum falaha, and if you choose another path, it's against you. You know, I think, <laughs> I think you should have your own channel. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. What uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, a very, very, very uh, comprehensive, uh, you know, response. 
And the idea that I'm going to get uh, is, is to, for us to go to the Quran, you know, to look at Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and look at excellence in his broadest sense. Ibrahim? I think, you know, there's one sentence that encompasses it. Mm. Never disappoint. Mm. Never disappoint. That's the essence of excellence. Mm, correct, yes. You know, whatever you do, mm. the minute you disappoint somebody, mm. you have not excelled. Correct. You know, to, to put it very simply, if you read your salah mm. and you don't do it correctly, mm, correct. you're disappointing the Almighty. Mm -hmm. If you invite somebody home and you don't do it at the mm -hmm. level that you would not want them to be disappointed, mm -hmm. then you're doing it at an excellent mm -hmm. level. You know, so, so I think excellence is about disappointment. Mm. And the quantum of that disappointment can vary. Mm. You know, I think Brother Ziyad is encompassed very well in terms of what is expected of us mm. as Muslims, mm. etc. But I think to put it very simply, that the day you disappoint, whether you're hosting a function, whether you're talking mm. to somebody, whether you arrive on time, mm. is when you have walked away from excellence. But you know, it's a point. Uh, the point is, and maybe Mobin, you could come in here, that today it be has become like a norm. If you're just referring to a function, for example, uh, I know I, I was in a particular province in this country, I won't mention it because uh, I love them. Uh, so I was rushing for a nikah. So the guy tells me, why are you rushing? <laughs> why are you rushing? I said, it's, they said after Zohar, you can brother wait to have a two hours nap, they will not have the nikah yet, you know. And it's something that we have begun to accept. Uh, Mobin, from your perspective in terms of what has been said and your own understanding of excellence. Based on what you're saying, mediocrity has become very easy. Mm. So if you're not engaged, it's very easy to be mediocre. Mm. But excellence is a pursuit that I think everybody should be on forever. I don't believe in ever attaining it mm. because it's a constant pursuit that you will go mm. and you will get mm. to a point of what you believe is excellence yeah. only to realize you're at the bottom of the next mountain. Yeah. And you continue going to the highest level of the, the depths rather of this excellence in trying to be better and better and better in whatever you do. And I think as Yad may have quoted, I think uh, all the very, very pertinent points from the Quran that as Muslim people, we need to be excellent in whatever we do. That is what has been, uh, you know, the expectation on us. Mm. But many a time, I think when we brought up, we're not given um, the vision of excellent. We may be given the vision of prestige or money, but what's beyond that? Mm -hmm. Beyond prestige, beyond money, beyond any of this is excellence. Because if you chase excellence, success will chase you. Because excellence is benchmarking yourself against your potential, mm. opposed to success, which is benchmarking yourself against somebody else. Mm. So excellence by far for me is the pursuit of, an ongoing pursuit rather, of achieving something greater of who you are, or okay. benchmarking against yourself. Okay, I mean the point that you made, I mean I'm reminded, uh, I think it was Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, for a believer, no two days are the same. And uh, uh, what's your understanding of that particular hadith? Well, first, the hadith says that person whose two days is, are the same has incurred a loss upon himself. Mm. Okay. And understanding basically is if we get back to the first verse that we said that Allah says that we created life and death in order to test mm. the, ex uh, the excellence of your actions. Right. Okay. So, Amalan. Mm. Muslims for a long time have come to confuse a ritualistic worship mm. with excellence. We should only excel mm. in a ritualistic mm. worship. Right. But from the hadith that we quoted that Allah has commanded excellence in everything, mm -hmm. we understand that it has to be infused in everything. Now there's another very important hadith, it's called the hadith of Jibril. Mm. And in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said to Jibril, or Jibril rather said to the Prophet ﷺ, Wa mal ihsan? Mm. What is ihsan? Mm. And the Prophet ﷺ is replying, he says, An ta'bud Allaha ka annaka tarohu. That you worship Allah as if you see him. Mm. Fa in lam takun tarohu fa innahu yarok. Because if you don't see him, he sees you. Now let's just put that into perspective now. What this means is, is that if we carry out every single action, mm. whether it's being on time for a meeting, mm. whether it's, imagine a lady preparing a pot of food mm. and she's doing it excellently because she knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching her. Mm. She makes a beautiful niya and mm. says, yeah Allah, I'm preparing this food to strengthen my family for your worship. Mm. What happens, mundane activities become acts of worship. And this is the purpose of Islam, is that every single one of our actions becomes an act of worship because Allah says, uh, that he created us. That I created men and jinn only that they should worship me. And we know you cannot pray mm. for 24 hours mm. or fast mm. for eternity. So how is it that you would function mm. so as to worship Allah only? It's by making every single action of ours an act of worship. That means the way we do business, 
the way we sleep, the way we eat, the way we interact. If we do this, inshallah, then what happens is we become people of, of mm. excellence and then we are properly representing the Prophet ﷺ and our deen. Just uh, hold the thought. So there we have it, you know, uh, I mean, what I've gathered from each one of you, that excellence ought to be a way of life in every aspect, not only in our rituals. And the point that you made, Ibrahim, is uh, not to disappoint. And the point that you made also, Mobin, that excellence is a never-ending journey. Therefore, I came back and that was a reminder that for a believer, not two, no two days are the same. And I think, you know, it's, it's an opportune time, it's expedient for us to introspect and reflect and ask yourself, what am I doing? How well am I doing it? Is Allah pleased with me? Am I, as Mobin reminded us, celebrating mediocrity? We'll be back immediately after this. Time is now. Time is now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I, I want to, in this segment, you know, from what uh, you, uh, all of you have shared with me, uh, the, I don't want to get away from the narrow understanding that some people see excellence purely in salah or in the rituals, right? And they are important, of course, that you got to read it in such a way, at such a level that you have the sakina the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi spoke about. But I want to look at excellence in the workplace. The reason I'm saying this, uh, I yet to come across people and it's, it's, a, it's a, perhaps a diminishing minority who will say, you know what, I really enjoy working with this Muslim guy or this sister. They are really good, they're very, very kind, they conduct, and so on and so forth. So when you look at, uh, Ziad, uh, excellence in the workplace, uh, what comes to your mind? What are some practical things that we can do? I think simple, apart from the workplace, in life in general, yeah. if we want to take this vast concept mm. and condense it and make it easily implementable. Mm. We need to bring Ihsan into our thoughts, mm. into our speech, mm. and into our actions, mm. okay? And first of all, we are required to have good thoughts. If you were having bad thoughts, for mm. example, we now know through biopsychology mm. that you're harming your own body, mm. okay? And when we come to speech, which is one of the most powerful instruments mm. of interacting with, out, with, with other human beings, and speech, whether it's in the workplace, or whether it's in the home, or whether it's in wider society, has to be guarded. Allah says in the Quran, Woman ahsanu qawla mimman da'il Allah. And who's more beautiful in speech than the one that causes, uh, calls to? Good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a beautiful hadith in Bukhari that the Sahaba came to the Prophet sure. and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we know of this woman that prays at night, meaning she's making tahajjud yeah. in addition to her prayers. Mm -hmm. And she fasts during the day, mm -hmm. meaning she fasts outside of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. And she gives lots of charity. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just stop there for a moment. Mm -hmm. We would consider a person like this in our understanding today. We'll say, this is a pious, this mm -hmm. is a sheikh. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is piety. You're right. But then the Sahaba said, but she harms her neighbors with her tongue. Mm -hmm. And the Prophet mm -hmm. said, there's no good in her. She's of the people of hellfire. Oh, oh, oh. And then, the Sahaba said, but we know of this woman. She fasts, uh, she prays only the prescribed prayers. Mm. And she fasts only the prescribed fasts. But she doesn't give much in charity, mm. but she doesn't harm people with her tongues. Mm. The Prophet said, she is of the people of Jannah. paradise. Mm. So now when we come into our workplaces, when we're dealing, coming just back to what we said about, you know, uh, Ibrahim brought up mm. about uh, pitching up on time and yeah. what we would consider the mundane yeah. activities. The Prophet ﷺ says that Allah took his mercy and he divided into a hundred parts. Yeah. You know, 99 he kept with himself and one part he put into operation. Yeah. Okay, so that all the mercy you witness in the entire creation, that means from the beginning till the end is from that one portion. Yeah. Yeah. So the only job we have is to attract that mercy, mm. because we cannot we cannot enter Jannah mm. except through the mercy of Allah. of Allah. Mm. And Allah says in the Quran, "Inna rahmat Allahi qaribu min al muhsinin that the mercy of Allah is close to the people of Ihsan. Now, what we have to understand is that every single possible interaction is an opportunity to get to paradise. Mm. So, when you're dealing with your staff, mm. for example, talking to your person, whether it's the cleaner or your manager. That is a potential moment mm. that could, could get you into yeah. paradise. Mm. Dealing with your customer, mm. the difficult one and the good ones. Mm. The staff, the difficult one and the easy ones. 
So wherever you find yourself, whether you are a teacher with a difficult pupil, uh, an employer mm. in your workplace, a parent with his child, anywhere you find yourself, we should look at every opportunity as a moment through which we could attain paradise. Even when you're dealing with a recurring visitor like me. Jazakum you know? <laughs> <laughs> for that, Ibrahim. There's very little left to be said. I think the answer, you, know. <laughs> you know, I think Idris, it's, it's a challenge. Mm. It has to be a habit mm. before it becomes something that you, you mm. strive for on, a, on an ongoing basis. Mm. It's like Mubin spoke, it's a journey. Mm. It's not a destination. Mm -hmm. I think from the time when you get up, mm. everything you do, and I think excellence, yes, as much as it's within yourself and in terms of how you treat mm. yourself, and Ziad's referring to all the biomedical mm. stuff that influences your moods mm. and your actions and mm. reactions, mm. if they're negative. I think it comes down from a business perspective, is that your dealings with your, your customers, mm. your suppliers, the people you interact with, keeping to your times, mm. you know, if you're a manufacturer and you're producing, mm. you're producing at the best level mm. that you can. And I think excellence is not something that you can put in a little box. Mm, correct, yeah. You can't. I think, and, and, and let's be very honest, I mean, we spoke a bit about mediocrity seems to be the norm, but at the same time, I think there are a lot of businesses out there, Muslim businesses, Muslim businessmen, that strive to be excellent. Yeah. And, and you see that excellence when you interact with them. Mm. You know, from the time you arrive at the door, mm. There's just a whole aura of mm. this is a professional business. Mm. You met on time. Mm. You you know you you, you treat it with the mm. utmost respect. Mm. The meetings are kept on time. So that level of excellence, and I'm simplifying it. Mm. I mean, uh, in a sense that we have to practice it, and it's got to become part of your subconscious. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will never be there. Mm. You know, I think what we tend to see very often is when it is not excellent. Mm but we don't tend to recognize it when it is excellent. Mm. We on your show, you're given a 10 minute segment. Mm. You ended in 10 minutes. Mm. That's not mediocrity. Mm. And you strive to do that. Mm. And let's recognize that excellence, let's recognize that level of accomplishment. Mm. And I think that is when you start getting people to appreciate, you know, because when somebody does it, if you go to a function and the Nikah is at 10 o'clock and it happens at 10 o'clock, mm. We forget about it. Mm. But if it is at quarter past 10, mm. we'll remember it. So I think it's also important for us mm. as people that deal with humans mm. and would deal with people all the time is the minute we see that level of excellence, you stand up and say, thank you, in a nice way, you know, without being patronizing, mm. to acknowledge the excellence. And I think that creates and gives people that recognition. Because the last thing you want is you strive so hard to start at 10. Mm. And it's not acknowledged. Mm. And then. You know, but if you started at quarter past 10, mm. it's spoken about. So I think it's got to work two ways. Mm. If we want excellence to permeate in people's lives, mm. let's recognize it and let's reward it. And that's how we get people to become more excellent. Mm. Mobin? I think <clears throat> as Muslims, we, if the expectation is to be excellent. Mm. If ever we're not excellent, it's purely because we're not conscious of what we need to be. Mm. But if we engage ourselves to be conscious of that mm. and continually aim to do it, chances are we'd probably get there. Like Ibrahim saying, there's many businesses that you'd find that you just get that, that aura or that feel. It's because how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if you get that excellence at your core, and in, like he said, your subconscious, what starts happening is that whatever you're doing in autopilot mm. becomes X of excellence. So I think the, 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 the tough part is to get it into your subconscious, get it into your core. Mm. Believe that as the, 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 the navigation system mm. of the world. And if you do that, wherever you're going to go, you're going to permeate excellence. In fact, I just want to cite uh, two incidents that happened to me <clears throat> years ago, and may Allah grant all our parents the high status in Jannah. My father used to do the books of the shop, right? You know, So one day he said to me, uh, Idris, I would like you to do this, but only do it if you're doing it well. Otherwise, tell me, I don't, I'll get someone else to do it. That was his philosophy, right? No one. And the second one is, I, I like I visit many of my friends in their homes and sometimes you get these kids, you know, Allah bless them. They treat you with so much of dignity. I went to one home and the boy tells me, I said, you like family? He said, no, no, you are family, you know, uncle, you are family. Please come in. Can I get you something if my dad will be here in a moment? Now that's the excellence in akhlaq, you know, right. because the impression I also get is very, very important is that when you're pursuing excellence, 
They are people who benefit from you. That's the point. Excellence is not about me, myself, why, that I'm the only beneficiary of that. So in terms of, you know, you mentioned early on, uh, Ziyad, uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, worse the effect that I've come here to perfect morals and so on and so forth. How critical is it in terms of what you observe, in terms of the social etiquette today? Do you find that uh, more and more people are displaying that excellent social etiquette do you think is missing? Seriously missing. Mm. You know, in fact, the Prophet mm. says in the hadith, Allah has made the human heart inclined naturally mm. towards one that shows kindness mm. towards mm. it. So this is the way that we draw people closer to each other. If we look at Muslims today, we find Ihsan is absent in the Ummah because Muslims are fighting each other. Mm. You know, the Prophet said it. that the Muslim Ummah is like one body. Mm. And if you understand biology, mm. when the cells, when the parts of one body mm. attack each other, you call that uh, immune deficiency syndrome. Correct, yes. You know, you've got a cancer yeah. inside of you. And what is it that will neutralize that? It's this concept of, of ihsan, of treating each other beautifully. And this is the, the objective. If we just take, for example, you know, I was speaking to somebody recently and he said he traveled to Europe, for example, and they treated him so well. Mm. And then he flew from there to the Middle East and he was shocked at the mm. way they treated him. And I said to him, imagine if Muslims understood Ihsan mm. and you landed at a country, a Muslim country, and the guy at passport control mm. looked at you as a possible ticket to Jannah. Look How would he treat you? Mm. And then the taxi driver treats you as a possible ticket to Jannah. And then the store you go into, he treats you as a possible ticket to Jannah. And the hotel staff treat you as a possible ticket to Jannah. And the general population of that land treat you as a possible ticket to Jannah. Who would not want to come to Muslim lands? Mm. We're fighting today because non-Muslims don't want to take Muslims yeah, yeah. into their lands. Yeah. Where's the ihsan of this ummah mm. for them to take care of their, of their own? And we can bring any problem you want to. Mm. And if you just bring this understanding mm. that by doing business well, mm. by transacting well, mm. you could have a possible ticket to Jannah, mm. what happens is all the social problems mm. are all eradicated. Mm. You know, with one concept, Ihsan. You know, uh, <laughs> that time is great, really. The, uh, you know, it's about really living consciously and with intentionality. You know, when you deliberately, you know, and uh, when you're speaking about the passport control, these are opportunities that we have, you know. And inshallah, uh, I pray, you know, that we understand the capacity that a human being has to aspire towards being angelic is great. At the same time, we have the potential to be worse than animals. So I like to believe, inshallah, that there is decency in us and that we want to embrace all that is noble. Time is Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As I like to say, I like it. <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Nice to see you all smiling. Right, uh, we, we spoke initially in the first segment, we tried to define what's uh, ihsan, what's excellence. Then the second component you spoke about, let's focus a bit on the workplace. But the third one is about focusing on the self. Ziad, I know, just now a break, you want to share something. Just first of all, you know, taking on what uh, Mubin said, you know, Aristotle says, if we are what we repeatedly do, mm -hmm. excellence then is a habit yeah. and not an act. Yeah. That's the first the yeah. important thing, yeah. you know. Now, how is it that we can make this a habit? Mm. This is the important thing. And we want to go back to the hadith of Jibril, mm -hmm. that the Prophet mm -hmm. was asked by Jibril, Wamal Ihsan, what is Ihsan? And he said, An Allah ka anna ka tarahu. Did you worship Allah? As if you see him, mm. and if mm. you can't see him, he sees you. Mm. And this brings the concept of taqwa. Mm. Taqwa means that Allah is watching you all the time. So what happens is, even though we cannot remember mm. every act what to do, but if you can imbibe this one consciousness in your mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me, then that makes it easier to regulate your actions. So this is the fee first precondition for ihsan. Mm. The second important thing is that the act itself must be beautiful. Mm. You see, in terms of business, you'll only want to be excellent and that means you want to make the most money and mm. we would consider that mm. as, as excellence. Mm. But it has to have this element of beauty. Make the money, no problem, mm. but do it 
beautifully. Mm. So the Prophet awesome says in a hadith, exactly. he says, for ajmilu fi talab. So make your pursuing it beautiful. Mm. And he's talking of money. Mm. You okay? And the third component is that whatever you do, it must be sincere. So what happens is we have people today that maybe pray, for example. You know, there's a hadith of the Prophet sure, awesome. he says that a man will be brought on qiyamah. He will be an alim and a man that knows the Quran. Allah will say, I gave you the knowledge of the Quran and the deen. How did you use it? He said, yeah, Allah, to teach your deen and to recite your Quran. Allah will say, no, you lied. You did it so people could say, mashallah, what a learned man. Mm. And alhamdulillah, you're such a beautiful reciter of the Quran. So they said it. And you will be dragged on your face into the fire. Mm. And the Prophet also mentioned about a generous man and a shaheed also in the same hadith. Mm. So what we see, what is the element that's absent here is sincerity. Mm. And it comes back to the consciousness. It must be done for the sake of Allah. Number four, the act itself must be correct. Mm. You know, I cannot perform three rakats of Dhawar beautifully. Yeah. That's it has to be four, mm. you know, and number four, it must be Kamil, it must be complete. The act must be complete. So whether you're doing business or whatever it else, it must be complete. So if I perform Dhawar at its right time, but I only want to make two rakats, if I'm not a traveler, it's not acceptable. So it has to be complete. So these five things, first of all, are going to help us to bring this consciousness into our lives. And then we have to become conscious of this tongue. Mm. Because the Prophet Sallam says in the hadith to Mu'adh, mm. you know, he says, can I tell you something upon which everything depends on? And Mu'adh said, Bala ya Rasulullah, please. He took out his tongue and he said, mm. Kuffa alayka mm. He yeah. said, restrain this thing. Mm. He said, Ya Rasulullah, wa inna la mu'akhiduna bima natakallamu bi? Will we be taken to account for what we say? Mm. He says, Thakilatka ummaka ya Mu'adh. He says, may your mother be bereft of you Mu'adh. Wa hal yakubbu nasu ala hujuhim? Uh, let a man be flung onto his face or his forehead into the fire except for what his tongue has earned so this is the most important thing and another hadith the Prophet mm -hmm. says he says al -hayau min al -imani. you know that modesty is from faith mm -hmm. wal fil -jannati. and faith is in paradise wal min al -jafai. and vulgarity mm -hmm. is from rudeness and rudeness is in the fire. So these simple, you know, we have these things that when we in social company, mm. we can say what mm. we want to mm. say. But if we don't become conscious, it becomes your pattern. Mm. And then when you become angry, you cannot control yourself mm. in the workplace or at home. Mm. So we have to become these beings that are conscious of our speech and then obviously of our of our actions, mm. because the Prophet oh. says just the last thing, he says, Ma shay'un athqalu mm. fi mizani al mm. min husni khuluqin. Mm. Nothing will be more heavy on the scales of a believer than his beautiful actions, mm. his beautiful You know, the, I mean, uh, from what you are saying, I mean, it's very, very comprehensive. Ibrahim, you know what, we are, we are gregarious animals, we interact with people, and sometimes we are so unconscious, we do not realize that we often hurt people. Sometimes the people that we're supposed to love most, our own families, we hurt them on a daily basis. So what you are saying is to be self-aware, uh, to have the taqwa, right? In terms of uh, personal development, uh, you find, you know, for, we just mentioned in an earlier program that when people ask me this one question, what do you think is the biggest issue impacting on the ummah? I said the biggest issue is you forfeited the first ayah, ikra. We do not read. There are a bunch of ignorant people. We have no idea about what Islam is all about, the deen, the world that we are staying in. And now in terms of personal development, and I know, uh, you know, it's something that you also subscribe to. What are things that we should do an individual person watching the program for him to develop himself, to become that confident, articulate, loving Muslim again? It's like how long is a piece of string it is. Yeah. I think the challenge is very simple. I think it comes from your inner self yeah. in terms of how you view the people around you, how you, you, how you view the environment around you. You know, to get to the levels that Ziyad is talking mm. about is a challenge. Mm. I think we're all guilty of the fact that we'll be in company and we'll, we'll make a joke. Mm. And, and often we say things mm. that afterwards we realize that it's not right. Mm. So I think the first thing is that there's a lot of characteristics that Islam preaches to us, which I think, you know, it's like an equation. Uh, this plus that equals excellence. Mm. So respect, humility, mm. um, kindness, mm. 
integrity, mm. honesty. Mm. If you take all those individual mm. characteristics mm. and you put them together, mm. the end result is excellence. Mm. Correct. And, and, you know, so we shouldn't be striving for excellence per se. We should be striving to fix all those individual characteristics. Mm. And once you get that, mm. it's an end result of something without you having, I don't want to be excellent, but I want to be good in the sense that I respect my elders, I respect the young ones, I respect my friends. When I deal with you, I want to do it with honesty and integrity. You know, so all those characters, once you espouse those characteristics and you, and you present those, mm. you will be seen as excellent. I mean, if I, you know, we, we, we love the word function. Yeah. If I respect my guest yeah. and I start on time, yeah. the functions becomes excellent. Mm. If I respect my guest and if I'm going to do something, I do it to the best of my ability. The end result is excellence. So excellence is not something that you can put in a jar and sell it. Yeah. I think it's the ingredients that come from all around. And, and Ziad has spoken a lot about it. Mobin has mm. spoken a lot about it. Is once you practice those individual characteristics, the end result is excellence. Okay, the, uh, I mean, the whole issue, and they say an apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Uh, perhaps, do you not think perhaps, as the Amir of the home or the elders, I mean, in our own home sometimes, that we, we take these things for granted, that we forget sometimes that children embrace what we do. They take the best and all the worst from us. So perhaps, Mubin, you know, as parents, the family as a whole, how can we promote this? And in terms of not only they're benefiting from you, they can only benefit from you when you have also developed yourself on a personal level. Of course, I think <coughs> kids uh, do what they see and feel around them. But greater than that is that if you align excellence to impact, mm. and if you more so teach children to pursue impact, rather than pursuing money or status or prestige or any of that mm -hmm. things. What happens is that this child chases impact and he changes the face of the world 20 years from today because he's got to go beyond what is the norm of what normal people are pursuing. Mm -hmm. So if from young we teach them pursue impact, you find a greater world will be created in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think it's vitally important that within the, the home or in wherever, workplace or wherever, we, we, we teach excellence or we, we live excellence because all it does, it creates, a, the world vibrates at a different level. Mm -hmm. It's a new vibration. You see something uh, uh, different because people are wanting to be better. Mm -hmm. People are aspiring to a higher moral code. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, uh, that's a point. And there was a time when the Muslim was respected and Muslims were great contributors. They were not passive receptacles or or consumers, right? And do you not think perhaps because the, the element of excellence, not withstanding what you mentioned, is missing, that today we are not uh, contributing in inverted commas. And the question to be asked is a, a question to be asked if, for example, today, if say Muslims were removed from the face of the earth, I'm not looking at the spiritual aspect, to what extent that the rest of society would be at a loss? Zero. Sadly, zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at um, Islamic contribution mm. to civilization, mm. going back to way before mm -hmm. the Renaissance, mm -hmm. it is absolutely enormous. Mm. I mean, from anything, everything we use today, from what we eat, uh, the phones we use, there's some element of Islamic innovation that mm. contributed to that. Simple question you ask yourself, show us one leading university in a Muslim country, in the top 10, top 20, top 50, top 100 universities in the world. Mm. Top few hundred, by the way. We don't have. So yeah. absolutely, I think we've lost our path. We have stopped contributing to what we believe can help. I mean, so without, a, without even debating it, yes, we would not be missed because there's no innovation. There's no contribution. So uh, my beloved brothers and sisters, I mean, from what has been said at the latter part of the last segment of this segment is that uh, we as a Ummah, we are in, in a kind of crisis. And, uh, and I think that although there are pockets of excellence in some homes, uh, I think it's important that this should become an omatic thing that we need together from our leadership and everywhere else to pursue excellence unrelentingly so that the next day is better than the day uh, before. We'll be back immediately after this. Time is now. Time is now. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, after Ibrahim spoke, I hope you didn't feel despondent and you're wiping away the tears and everything else in Ibrahim. We don't want them to leave uh, despondent. Sure. But I think it's important, you know, uh, to recognize where we are. Then you know where we should go, what we should do, you know. It's about accelerated learning. So in terms of this, I mean, the viewers are there. We want, we like to translate all of this information must lead to transformation. Inshallah, our legacy would be when someone says, you know, I heard that program and my gosh, we all started reading books, you know, for example. That's what, uh, some of the things that we need to do on a practical level. Now, having recognized where we are, this malaise as you were in our uh, community or in the Ummah, what must be done on a practical level? Three or four things every home must do, schools should do, Imams must do in the mosque. What messages they need to give? I think the, the essence is when the Prophet said, sorry, seek sorry. knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Mm. And travel to China if you have to get it. Mm. And I think that is where we got to go back to it. A lot of people are going to China. But <laughs> Already to become doctors. So, we seek it. <laughs> so I think that the first challenge for us as Muslims, mm. uh, you know, it also comes from the fact that if you look at the innovation pre the Renaissance, mm. and the, it was through survival and the need to, to produce. I mean, you look at a lot of countries today, they produce because they're in a survivalist mode. Mm. You look at our Muslim countries predominantly, they're constantly in a situation where they're under bombardment and they've got wars. So that whole mindset has changed. But even here, if you take us locally in, in, in South Africa, you look at the advent of Muslim schools, whatever, rightly or wrongly, and mm. everybody has their views. Those things came out of a mode to survive, mm. not for your own personal self, but to keep your culture mm. and, and all of those things. So you tend to become more innovative when you're surviving. Mm. If I put you in, in the middle of nowhere and you have no food, you're going to make means. Mm. And I think we, we become consumers of a material economy. Mm. You know, everything we want today is easily available. It's that instant gratification. Mm. So I think it starts about going back and understanding about all the Muslim innovators, the coffee innovators, the, the, the medical innovators. Mm. I mean, there's amazing books on how mm. Muslims innovated. Mm. I mean, you look at the computer today, the phone, the essence of that started with the Muslims. Mm -hmm. And it's teaching our children that. Mm. I mean, you know, for me, there's a couple of things, and I talk of schools. Is there a curriculum in a Muslim school that teaches our kids mm. about innovation from Islamic civilization? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at uh, the times of, of mm. the Khalifa, mm. I mean, you look at, you said you're going to Turkey, mm. you look at what has happened there, in the times of, of, of how they rule the world and how they innovate. We never learned that in school. Mm -hmm. We learned about the great track and mm -hmm. about the Quintington. So the schools need to go back and teach our children about how much Muslims contributed. In fact, Ibrahim, I, I know in the, in the UK they had this exhibition. There is a book, you must have come across it, 1001 inventions, Muslim inventions. Right. So what the kids do, they reinvent what has been reinvented and they do a presentation. And then, you know, what it does for them, when they go through this whole process, they begin to understand the creativity of those people who invented it and what the purpose, what a contribution. And inshallah, it inspires them also to leave that kind of legacy. Before, I just want to ask you one. If you ask a child about coffee today, what mm. comes to their mind? Mm. They'll talk of a brand. Mm. That kahwa mm. started with. Mm. And it's, it's only when you educate the children mm. to they excel. Mm. And I think that is the essence of it. It's about educating our kids mm. and getting them going. I think for some of us, it's too late. Mm. But I think the children is where it is. And mm. I think that's where it's got to start, is that if they can see how smart and how uh, profound Muslim civilization has been mm. in terms of what they've contributed. Because we know the Western media marginalizes mm. our contribution mm. to mm. society. Mm. And let's reawaken that. Mm. I think our most important thing is to first define our priority. Mm. You know, material success is not our ambition. Yeah. The purpose of a Muslim is to bring about social harmony mm. on earth. Mm. So when we're looking in the medical field, and this is what set the old people, our predecessors apart from us, mm. their striving to serve humanity mm. is what made them innovate mm. medicine. Mm. They're striving to make things easy for people yeah. is what made them innovate in terms of architecture mm -hmm. and engineering. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, the purpose of a Muslim is to establish harmony on earth. Mm -hmm. Excellence is not an outcome, it's a habit. Mm -hmm. The outcome is success. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yeah. 
So we don't need to consciously go and build <clears throat> universities. Mm. When we understand the importance of knowledge mm. and being excellent in pursuing knowledge, the outcome will be that we will build mm. the, the institutions. But it has to come back to what Ibrahim is saying, that we have to educate the people about this. Correct, yeah. We have to educate them about the importance of, I don't want to just use the word excellence. You know, because excellence always giving you this business kind yeah, of correct, understanding. Yeah, there has to be a slash and say beauty. Mm. Okay? So there has to be this excellence and beauty in everything we pursue. And if we understand that our duty is to serve humankind. Mm. Allah says in the Quran, He says, Alladina yunfiquna fi sarai wa darai. Those that spend in prosperity and adversity. Wa kaadhi min al ghayth and they repress their anger. Wa'afina mm. anin nas, mm. and they're forgiving to people. Wallahu yuhibbul muhsinin, and Allah loves the people of mm. Ihsan. You see, mm. Ihsan is something that we're putting into each of these categories, mm. and the outcome is success. So Allah says in the Quran, because we want success, right? We want success in this world, mm. but we want success in the Akhirah. Mm. And Allah says in the Quran, He says, Man amila salihan, min dhakarin aw untha, wa huwa mu'minun. That whoever performs Amalun Saliha in Arabic means actions that balance. Mm. This is what it literally means. Mm. That means if we see sickness, mm. we have to bring the balance mm. by bringing the cure. Correct. If there's poverty, we have to bring balance, mm. okay, by empowering people. If we see starvation, we have to bring the food. Mm. So when we do these actions that balance, Allah says, and you are a believer, then Allah says, we will give you the good of this world and we will reward you according to the ihsan of your actions. So meaning now that we will have to innovate because we want to bring the balance in, in society. When there's ignorance, we have to balance it with education. Wherever we see mm. the, the, the deficit, you know, wherever we see the, the shortcoming, we have to compensate by bringing the aspect that will balance it. And this is what's going to cause us to innovate for the sake of benefiting humankind. So, I mean, uh, what both of you are saying is really uh, responding to the need of the time, yes. right? Responding to the need of the time and doing it beautifully. Yes. You know, it's about, again, it's about a selflessness. It's about being impactful. Like, you know, the whole issue when he spoke about the Muslim schools and everything else. I mean, they, there is one, are you learning to earn or learning to serve? And that's a fundamental thing. But I think today, uh, when you look at the word success, uh, we measure it purely in terms of how I can benefit. Mubin? I think as Muslim people, we are a smart group of people. Hmm. The challenge we have is that you grow up, if you look at any community, if you, know, you, if you go back in history, you find that most of the inventors or innovators came from one little village in either Italy or in the Middle East or somewhere, but they all came from, three or four of them came from one place. Hmm. It's because I saw what you were doing and you saw what he was doing and we all decided, shoo, let's go and invent a telephone now. Mm -hmm. We can't just be opening a shop on the corner. Mm -hmm. you know? So if we as a community put our minds together to go and change the world and create something bigger mm -hmm. than buying a house or buying a car, living a good life and traveling abroad, we will attain that. There is a smaller population in the world that's controlling 70% of this economy mm. because they closed off all the gaps of where the money was going out of this exactly. cycle. If we as a community go in and say, number one, we're going to be leaders in education. We're going to change the world financially. We're going to change the way we, we, we bring our children up, educate ourselves, operate the world or operate within this world and economy. You may find that we will change the world. But if our goal then again is to just live a good life, then I'm sure you'll get that. It's all dependent on what do we want. So if we can, uh, it, from, from the household, widen that goal and again come back to impact. Mm. So how, how, what do you want to do? B greater than being a doctor. There's something greater than that. Mm. Go right to the top. Mm. And if we can do that, mm. you'd find us now moving the world in the direction we want it to go in. Alhamdulillah, uh, there we have it. What a, alhamdulillah, uh, stimulating uh, discussion. And I take away from this a few things. It's about having a vision about pursuing excellence in every aspect of your life, never to disappoint. And as you were speaking, I'm reminded our mm -hmm. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came as a mercy unto all mankind. That everyone should benefit from the action of a believer. And I think as parents, as teachers, we need to relook at the curriculum. We need to relook at our methodology. What we want is to inspire young people, inspire ourselves to live 
a mark to make a difference so that inshallah it is through Allah's mercy that you will attain Jannah because you left the world a far better place than what it was when you first came into this world. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.